Heavenly Father, thank you for what you have done um, for us. You have done to us in making us your children. You have adopted us who don't deserve anything. And you have made us uh, like your son. And you have given us all the benefits um, of sonship with him. I pray today, Father, for a clearer understanding of what that means um, so that it will change the way not only we pray, but indeed the way that we live our lives. Amen. <laughs> and this is the fifth and final, um, sadly in some ways, um, sermon in a series on prayer. Uh, I was talking to Tim on Thursday night and we both decided that there probably should be 10 or 15 um, because we've barely scratched the surface. Uh, from our reading, you may or may not be pleased to know that I'm not going to preach through the Lord's Prayer. I'm sorry if you are hoping that I would, maybe another time. But what I do hope to do, uh, as Warwick alluded to earlier, is to give you the key, to give you the true basis for, and the answer to many questions that you might have about prayer. Uh, now, I know that's a big claim, um, but we'll, we'll see how I go. Um, if you don't have it open, please open up to Matthew 6 um, because you need to do just a bit of speed reading for a minute because I want you to have a quick skim and I want you to tell me which word appears over and over and over again uh, in chapter 6. And despite the sermon being on prayer, it's not pray or prayer. Any volunteers? Come on, the Westies were quicker than this. Father, thank you, Warwick. You might have had inside information. In Matthew chapter 1, 2, 3 and 4, there is no use of the word to refer to God, our Father. In chapter 5, there are three. In chapter 7, there is one. But here in chapter 6, it is used 12 times. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that is no coincidence. God being our Father must be really important to what Matthew and, of course, what Jesus himself has to say in this chapter. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we can say that Jesus does not show us the way to God. Jesus is the way to God. He doesn't just point us to God like a good teacher. He is the way to God because he is a risen Saviour. And in this chapter, Jesus shows us that prayer is, is a radically different process for Christians than it is for any other philosophy or religion. In surveys, it is always amazing to me how many people will say that they have or they do at some times pray. Most people, even in post-Christian Australia, will say that. But there are two ways to approach the mighty king and creator of the universe. Because lots of people pray, but Jesus shows us here in Matthew 6 that there are two ways to pray. You can either pray as the pagans and the hypocrites do, or you can pray as Jesus prayed and instructed. In verses 5 and 7, Jesus talks about two different groups of people, but they are essentially the same. Today we think of pagans as irreligious people, maybe as violent and unruly. But Jesus doesn't talk of them like that. These pagans are religious. They pray. Maybe they even pray more than you or I do. They babble and they use many words. They are long-winded in their prayers. They are Gentiles. That's why he calls them pagans, not Israelites. But they are religious and they pray a lot. The other group Jesus calls the hypocrites. A word from the Greek theatre where an actor would wear a mask and so he would be literally two-faced. A hypocrite is someone who says or does one thing in one situation and speaks or acts differently in another. Now you probably know that the Pharisees were usually Jesus' target when he spoke of hypocrites and they too were very religious. They prayed at least three times every day. But here he accuses of them of doing it purely for their pride to have their ego stroked, to be noticed, to be seen. They were Israelites, 
but they were really acting like pagans. The real dividing line down through all of humanity, according to Jesus in Matthew 6, is not between the religious and the irreligious, but between the religious and the Christian. Between the people who pray like the pagans and the hypocrites and those who pray our Father. Jesus says, don't pray like the pagans do, thinking that they will be heard for their many words, because, verse 8, your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, some might say, maybe you might think, hopefully you don't after Tim talked about it last week, but you might think this is Jesus saying, well, you don't need to pray to ask God for things because God already knows what you need. He even knows what you're going to say. Someone else might say, well, of course Jesus is not saying that because the pattern that he gives us is full of asking for things. But prayer is not all about asking for things. What you'll see as we go along is that Jesus says prayer is all about being completely and desperately dependent on God for everything. Just as a small child is dependent on its father or its parents for everything. And of course, what comes from that realisation and that understanding is knowing that you need to ask for everything. Suppose you are totally paralysed and can do nothing for yourself but talk. And suppose a strong and reliable friend has promised to live with you and do whatever you needed done. Well, how would you glorify this friend if someone came to see you? Would you glorify his generosity and strength by trying to get out of bed and carry him? No, of course not. You would say, please come and lift me up. And would you put a pillow behind me so I can look at my guest? And would you put my glasses on for me? And your visitor would learn from your requests that you are helpless and that your friend is strong and kind and loving. You glorify your friend by needing him and by asking him for help and counting on him. Well, in John 15 verse 5, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So how do we glorify God? Well, Jesus gives the answer in John 15, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. We pray, we ask God to do for us through Christ what we can't do for ourselves, which is absolutely everything. And John 15, verse 8 gives us the result. By this, my Father is glorified. So how is God glorified by our prayer? Well, prayer is the open admission that without Christ, we can do nothing. And prayer is the turning from ourselves to God in the confidence that he will provide the help that we need. So we ask for things. Father, I want your name to be holy, set apart. I want your kingdom to come. I want your will to be done. I want you to supply my food for the day. I want your forgiveness. I want you to lead me away from tempting and please deliver me from the evil one. As Tim has told us often over the last few weeks, God wants us to be consistent and persistent in prayer. What Jesus is saying in Matthew 6 is that there are two different bases or starting points for praying to God. You can pray as the pagans do, trusting in your stature or your presence, or your many words, or you can go to him as your father, trusting in absolutely nothing about yourself. Jesus is not talking about whether to ask or not, but how you ask. Two very different bases for the approaching God. There are many people who say that they are a Christian and pray our father, but they don't pray our father because they don't go to God as Father. I've discovered that that's not me who's the blowing in the wind, it's the wind from the fans blowing on the microphone. They don't pray to our Father because they don't go to God as Father. Maybe that's you. According to Jesus, the key is, what is the cause for which you will be heard? Being religious, going to church, being busy for God, even praying up a storm here or, or down on the street corner. Those things don't actually tell you whether you are a Christian or not. The key is, 
What is the reason that you will be heard by God? Is it because you pray a lot and use many words and everyone knows who you are and knows that you pray a lot? Or is it because you pray to your Father? Let me try and explain. Jesus is talking in verse 8 about two ways of approaching God. When you have an exchange or an interaction, a give and a take with someone, we have to have a basis for that exchange. And that basis will determine the level of the interaction. If you're in Sydney and you go to Central Station, one of the normal things that you can um, approach someone for is to ask them, does this train go to Blacktown? Or how long will it take? Now that's okay, that's allowed. And the basis is a common humanity and most people know what it was like the first time that they went to a busy station. And so I'm sympathetic with your situation. But that's a pretty slim basis, isn't it? And you can't go much deeper than directions or asking the time. You can't say, can I have your shirt? Or can I have your briefcase? Or that's a nice watch, can I have it? No, you need to have a much deeper relationship, a much stronger basis in order to ask questions like that. Jesus is showing us here that there are only two basic ways that you can go to God in prayer. And they are the same two fundamental ways that we interact with each other. When we interact with each other, we can have a business relationship or we can have a family relationship. Now, of course, there are grey areas in between, but basically that's it. In a business relationship, the basis is, I have something for you. In a family relationship, the basis is what I am to you. In a business relationship, it is about performance. I do something for you, so you do something or give me something. In a family relationship, the basis is a commitment, a permanent, committed relationship to some extent regardless of performance. Or another way to look at it is there are two ways that you can live in a house. Yes, there's more, but fundamentally you either live in someone's house as a boarder or as a part of the family. So you can be a boarder or a tenant and have a good relationship with your landlord as long as you pay the rent and respect the property. And the landlord has certain rules they need to abide by and so you can have a pretty good basis for approaching one another. But it is essentially a business relationship of goods and services and no more. And in fact, if it crosses over that basis, it moves into a friend relationship, and that is okay. I still talk to Warwick even after living in his house for a couple of years. But what happens if one party starts to do the wrong thing? It's hard to chase down the rent if you become too friendly. Or it's harder to be generous if the walls have holes in them. Similarly, in a work situation, if a manager becomes too friendly with his workers, it's hard to put the screws on them if they are not pulling their weight as they should. That's because a business relationship is a conditional one and a family relationship is or should be very close to unconditional. One is performance, give and take, goods and services, what I have. The other is all about who I am. One is about doing, the other is about being. Now, the other alternative which Jesus is promoting is that you can live in a house as a child with your parents. You are not a boarder, you are a child. Now, the business model, and sadly for many Christians, is if you perform, then you will be accepted. But in the family, you already are accepted, and so you should perform. Two completely different ways of looking at and approaching things. And Jesus is saying that you can approach God in one of two ways. You can approach him on a business basis or you can approach him on a family basis. And he's doing that here with the example of prayer. Because you can babble and use empty words, vain repetitions, hoping that you will get what you want. Hoping to be heard because of your many words gives a sense of anxiety, doesn't it? Of being anxious about how those words will be received. And you can really tell on what basis you are going to God in prayer by your reaction when your prayers are going unanswered. If you are praying like a pagan with a boarder or tenant mindset, then you'll have one of two main responses. You will be cold towards God or you will be anxious. 
You'll be cold because you think, I've been paying the rent and so I deserve from you. Or you'll be anxious and think, well, I haven't been paying the rent, so I guess I don't deserve anything from you. Do you understand what I mean? If your life is not going well and you've been praying and praying and praying but nothing is improving, do you get angry because you've been doing the right thing? You've been praying, you've been going to church, you're a good person but God is not coming through and he jolly well should be. Because you've been paying the rent. Or do you get anxious and worried and perhaps guilty because, well, you've been letting him down. You haven't been a good person and you haven't really been paying the rent. Either way, you prove that you are a boarder and not a child of God. You might pray our father, but you see yourself as a boarder, not a child of the king. Either way, you see your relationship as a business transaction based on your performance and his. You've got your duties, he's got his. A religious person effectively says, God, come into my life and be my landlord. You do your part and I'll do mine. But a Christian says, Father, you have made me your child. Even though I am not worthy to gather the crumbs under the table, you have made me yours. It's a bit like the two men who went up to pray in Luke 18. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. You see, I pay the rent, so you should keep your end of the deal. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Father, I don't deserve your love and forgiveness, but because you are my father, I know you will have mercy on me. I don't deserve your favour, but Jesus has lived the life that I should have lived and died the death that I deserve. That is the only basis on which I come. You have adopted me as your son. Two different ways to approach God. And you can tell by looking at your prayer life where you are. Babbling implies empty, cold, impersonal, even mechanical. There's no love, no grace, no sweetness, no fullness in your prayers. This is very confronting, isn't it? It certainly was for me as I wrote it. And I'm not trying to discourage you from praying, far be it. And none of this is about eloquence or being articulate. It doesn't matter what I or anyone else here thinks of your prayers. But are your prayers cold and impersonal? You do them because you know you are supposed to do them, tick them off and get on with your day. Or are they anxious, nervous, guilty? I haven't been doing them properly. God is not answering. I mustn't be a very good Christian. I don't even know why I'm praying. Or are they warm, confident, loving, personal? Is your relationship one of a border or is it one of a child? Do you see why this is so important? Jesus, when he started to teach the disciples, did not start the Lord's Prayer with our King, although he is. Or our Creator though he is. He doesn't even start with our friend, even though he is. Jesus wants us to see that the way we understand the fatherhood of God and how we see ourselves as his adopted children tells us whether we are Christian or not, and it will most certainly affect the way that we pray to him. When a child is adopted, it is not due to their efforts or something that they have looked for or gone after. In most cases, they don't even know until after it happens. Adoption is an act of the father. And adoption is not a change in nature or behaviour. If you adopt an unruly child, their behaviour won't change straight away. 
It probably will over time, but the immediate effect of adoption is not a change in behaviour, but a change of status. And when you are adopted as a child of God, your behaviour won't immediately change. It will change over time. But it's a change in status from a pagan to a child of God that immediately matters. And it's not the father saying that if you misbehave and you grieve me, I'll send you back where you came from. No, it is the father saying, you are staying here, whether you misbehave or not. I will love you and be committed to you like my own flesh and blood. And that's what Jesus prays in John 17. He says to his father, I want you to love them even as you have loved me. How much does the father love Jesus. Through nothing in any way that we have done, but solely by what God has done through Jesus, we have been adopted as his children and given the full rights of his son. If you think that is too easy, then you show again that you are a boarder and not a child. If you think there is more to it than that, that you have to do something, that you have to be good, then you have a business not a family relationship with God. The reason Jesus start, says to start with Father is so that you are reminded every time that you pray that you have been adopted by God. Nothing to do with you, everything to do with him. You are totally dependent on him and that he loves you even as he loves Jesus. This understanding will transform your prayer life because it changes the throne of the king and creator of the universe into the throne of grace of your father. Can you see how this will change your prayer life? Hebrews 4 says, Because we have a great high priest, let us draw near to the throne of grace with confidence. And as Warwick read at the start in Matthew 7, Jesus says, You fathers, that's most some of us, though you are evil, you wouldn't give a snake to your son when he asked for bread. How much more can we expect from a perfect, a perfect father? And our father is not another kind of prayer alongside other kinds of prayers. It is the way that all other prayers must be done. Family prayer is the only way we can adore God in the way that we should. 1 John 3 says, see or behold, behold what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. God's love is so amazing and so marvellous. A Christian is a person who is amazed, who finds it totally unfathomable that God would pour out his love on us. There is a spirit, a sense of wonder that the boarder does not have. If you're a tenant or a boarder, praise and adoration of God is not natural. It's hard enough as a child of God. A boarder can go into God with a list of wants and desires and pray for 30 minutes, laying them all out, no trouble at all. But you will have a very hard time sitting down for 30 minutes to praise and adore him, if that is your mindset. If you aren't comfortable and assured in your status as a child of God, then praise will mean nothing to you. Adoration will mean nothing to you. If you are a boarder, you won't be amazed that you had your prayer answered. No, you paid the rent, you've done your part, of course he answered my prayers. But a Christian, a child, is amazed by everything that God has done for them. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 again, Behold! that he would call us children. It is amazing. It's a miracle. If you work hard all week and the boss gives you the pay slip, you don't say, behold, what a miracle, my pay. No, you say, of course, I've worked hard. I deserve this. If you aren't constantly amazed at the things God has done and is doing in your life, then you are a boarder and not a child. Or at the very least, you are a child, a Christian who doesn't yet comprehend the type of relationship that God has given you and wants from you. 
You see, a pagan cannot pray like a Christian. A pagan cannot pray like a Christian. But sadly, all too often, Christians, we can pray like pagans. Forgetting our total reliance and dependence on God for everything. Pagans get angry or sulky when their prayers aren't answered. They are paying the rent. They expect things to go well. And it's God's fault when they don't. There is no sense of praise, of adoration. But for a Christian, a child, they know that even their very best is nowhere near enough. Instead, it's, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood Died he for me, who caused his pain? For me, who him to death pursued? Then what? You all know it. Amazing love. How can it be? There is a wonder and amazement and an adoration in it. Without our Father, there is no hallowed be your name. Without our Father, there is no your kingdom come. Because if you are a boarder or a tenant, a pagan, then you only want God's kingdom to come so you can be like James and John in Mark 10, verse 37. Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. They didn't want Jesus to reign for his glory. They wanted him to reign so that they could sit beside him and receive the glory with him. And give us this day our daily bread. Jesus didn't say... Give us rain so that we'll have bread for next year. He didn't say give us bread for this shopping fortnight or even this week. No, Jesus says here and in other places that we are to bug God. In Luke 11, he says that we are to go to him with shameless audacity in seeking after our every little need. Again, Jesus reminds us that prayer is about being totally reliant on God for everything. Like the Israelites being commanded to only gather up enough manna for one day and if they gathered more it would spoil. That is this line from the Lord's Prayer in a practical example. You don't need to collect more than one day's worth. You can rely on me. I'm your father. I know and I want what is best for you. Go after God. Pursue him in your requests. Last week, Tim reminded us how Moses pleaded with God and he relented and didn't destroy the Israelites despite what they had done. And what about Abraham pleading for God not to destroy Sodom? If there are 50 righteous, will you still destroy Sodom? What about if there are 45 or 40 or 30 or 20 or 10? Sadly, there wasn't even 10 and so Sodom was destroyed. But Abraham kept pursuing God in order to change his mind. And that is what we should do, not be afraid to do. And quite obviously, Jesus wants us to pray at least once every day. We are a bit too comfortable, aren't we? We too easily take for granted the ability to pack a trolley with a week or when we're at Malali, 75 kilometres from town, two weeks worth of groceries into the trolleys. It might be okay to do that, but Jesus is saying, don't live with that attitude. Rely on your father. Joseph may have stored up seven years' worth of grain for all of Egypt, but I'm confident to say that he expressed his reliance on God every day. Seven years of food or not. Muslims believe that God is too great, too mighty to call him a father. That's blasphemy. But when Christians read the Bible, they can see those things and so much more. Take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. Don't let the people touch the mountain or they will surely die. Christians have a great and mighty God, all right. But the difference is we are his children. The only person who would dare wake a king at two in the morning for a glass of water is his child. It was a bit like that for Paul and Silas in uh, Acts 16, wasn't it, when they were in jail? And it was after midnight and they were praying and singing. If they had a border mindset instead of a child's, they would have been despairing, wouldn't they? 
Look at all we've done for you, God. You should set us free. Why are we in here anyway? No, instead, like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the fire, Paul and Silas were calmly and confidently talking to their father, singing praises to him. God can save us if he wants to, but even if he doesn't, we will serve only him. Is God your father or are you treating him like a landlord, the owner of the house? Can you see how it affects the way that you relate to him, the way that you pray to him, the how, the when or how often and what to say? These are answered by having God as your father, by having a father-child relationship with him. And it doesn't matter whether you had or have a really good or really bad relationship with your father. I was very fortunate to have a, and still have a wonderful relationship with my father, the complete opposite of what Kayleen expressed earlier. But it doesn't matter. We all know what a good father should be like. And if the difference between a good and a bad father is just a couple of centimetres, the difference between even the best father on earth and your heavenly father is millions of kilometres. Why wouldn't you talk to him often throughout the day about every little aspect of your life? Let's do that now. Uh, Father, we are amazed um, at what you have done for us, pouring out your love on us um, through your Son, adopting us as your children, uh, making um, you a Father to us. Heavenly Father, please, please remind us throughout this week um, of that relationship that you have made and that you want to have with us. Help us it, help it to truly affect the way that we pray to you, the way that we see you, the way that we see ourselves before you. That it might not only affect the way that we live our lives, but it might shine your light, reflect your glory to others around us. Uh, for Jesus' sake and for your glory. Amen.